my tent. We're here out on the West Desert uh, doing a wild horse camp and one of my previous uh, videos I did on rifles, one of uh, you subscribers called in or, or emailed me and asked me to do a, a video on shooting bags and powder horns. So for the next few minutes we're going to talk about a variety of powder horns, shooting bags and the things inside of them. So let's start down here. Um, let's start with bags. You can see that there's a variety of different styles of bags here. Most of these bags are made by myself or, or, or their owners. This is by my trapping partner Rick Williams that you've seen in a previous video on trapping. This is a beautiful elk foot bag. You can see the dew claws of the elk foot there and it makes a very nice treatment, a, good, a very good looking bag. And then we got uh, another good bag over here, a little different style. On a D-shaped, a little D-shaped pouch, a little bit smaller. But you don't want a great big bag that will carry too much stuff because if you get too big of a bag you're going to be tempted to load it up with, with everything you own for shooting and then it's going to be cumbersome and heavy to carry around. So it's nice to have a little bit smaller pouch. Here's a nice looking really weathered antique bag. You can see that this one might be worn by a friend, had, had been worn by a frontiersman for years and years and it's all worn out and, worn out and tattered. And uh, a little bit of work, you can artificially age a bag like that and make it look really good. And my most recent bag is, is this bag. It's got kind of an artificial beaver tail look to it. Some of these bags that the Mountaineers had, what well, they started out with, were commercially made um, cowhide bags that they might have bought in St. Louis and brought with them. And then as they, they wore out and got tattered like this, they might repair it or replace it with a new bag or make one out of brain tan. Uh, elk skin or deer skin out on the trail. Anything to keep all their gear together. So if you're making a bag, um, there's some books I'll show you here in a few minutes that will help you on dimensions and materials and the construction uh, patterns of putting the bag together. But one of the first bags I made early on was really a stiff leather box and I really didn't like it so much. It, it, it uh, carried things well in it but it was too uncomfortable to get into. So I like a bag that's a little more soft that you can get your hands into. And one of the things that you want to make sure is you got a, a flap that really covers it well or you put a clo an enclosure on there, a button or something, a way to close it so your stuff doesn't bounce out of the bag. Another mistake I made on earlier bags is I had a short flap that, and I bent the leather over and the, the, the flap was always flapping open and letting stuff bounce out. So. Again, in construction methods, there's ways to pin that down, or you want to. Sometimes you'll see uh, on bags they'll they'll put a flat piece of lead underneath the flap and sew around it as an as a weight to hold the bag down. So um, you you know you decide what shape kind what shape you want, what kind of bag. Um, again, going back to my persona video, that might be somewhat determined by what persona you're you're showing. You know. If, it would be okay to have an eastern bag as a western long hunter or western mountain man, but it wouldn't work very well vice versa to have a western style bag and have it back east. So you want to do a little bit of research on the, the type of bag you're going to use before you launch into all the, the lengthy process of making a bag and then decide later, oh, I don't like that. Of course, if you do that, then you just have the fun of, of making it again. So now let's talk about uh, the types of things we have commonly carry inside of a bag. Of course, the bag should carry all the things you need to feed and clean your rifle. Speaking on the feeding part, let's talk quickly about making bullets. Most uh, hunters will carry their own lead ladle and a supply of lead in small bars. Now, you get lead like this, you get resupplied with lead like this at the rendezvous. They bring out Galena. Uh, Lewis and Clark, interestingly, made gunpowder casks out of lead, and the amount of gunpowder in ratio to the amount of lead they had, and they made made their own uh, balls out you know, during the expedition. So, mountain men would find lead at a, at a rendezvous, carried in a, a convenient method. You know, I've, I've recast these into smaller bars to carry inside my pouch. So I usually have four or five of these balls, or these bars, floating around the bottom of the pouch. Then, when it comes time to make the the uh, balls, you just have to find some kind of stick out there. My friend has whittled this one up for me. And this looks like a, a small ladle, and it is. And the reason it's so small is because I don't want to carry a great big lead ladle around in my shooting bag. It takes up room and it's heavy. 
So I can melt up enough lead in here to cast about eight to ten balls in one of these ladles, or excuse me, ball molds. So we've got a couple here. This one came is a company called Rapine. Rapine, this is a steel mold, very solid. You can see that when you use these, you want to carry a ball inside there to keep the jaws together, right? And this one is a this one. This brass one comes from Dixie Gunworks. And there's a couple of other companies out now that are making molds. And of course, these are to the size of the caliber of your rifle. So you're going to heat up the, the lead over the fire, pour it in the, in the ball mold, wait till that cools a little bit, then knock out the, the ball and let it cool. When you do that, there's going to be a little sprue on there, that little part of the mold there, that you're going to use this scissors part here to cut off. So you can uh, pinch off that little piece of lead and save all those scraps and remelt those. So again, in the inside your shooting bag, you're going to want to have a lead ladle. Here's a nice new one that folds up so it doesn't take up quite as much room in your bag. This particular one comes from a company called Track of the Wolf up in Minnesota. I've mentioned that company before uh, in my videos. A good place to find uh, any of this black powder muzzle-loading equipment. Again, the, the ball molds, Dixie Gunworks, and Rapine bullet molds. Okay, now let's move on to some tools. It's very useful to have a number of, of tools. Of course, in our primitive gear, and our mountain man gear, we don't carry around modern, you know, Stanley or some kind of screwdriver. So you need to go to your blacksmith friend and have him make you a small pair of pliers or tongs like this to do. And these are good for all kinds of situations. Uh, use these particularly a lot in sewing up gear. When you're building your bag and pulling your needle through this heavy leather, it's nice to have a small pair of hand forged pliers. Now on those, you could take and file screwdriver ends, or turn screws as they called them back then, on the back end of your pliers for different screws on your gun. Or you have your, like I say, your blacksmith friend forge up a turn screw like this one. This fits a couple of different screw heads on, on my rifle. Now when it comes time to clean your gun, you're going to need a couple of tools like this one. This is called a tow worm. And one uh, great Saturday a few years ago, the, the gang and I got together and we went down to a, a blacksmith forge in one of the cities here and we all forged out our own uh, tow worm. And this was just a, uh, a piece of square stock and we uh, the smith showed us how to do all this fancy work on it. What that tow worm does is when it's time to clean your gun, you're going to take that worm and a little bit of this tow. And tow, what it is, is it's a little bit of refined flax material, flax from the plant. Um, and this has been carted out and cleaned up a little bit. And you just twist that in there. And of course, this end's attached to your wiping stick, your ramrod. You just dip that in some hot water and scrub out the bore of your rifle with this tow. And that's one of the one of the old methods that they use. And so we carry some of that tow around. And when you're done with it, really all you need to do is rinse out the black residue from the, the gunpowder. And you can use this tow again and again. You have to dry it out. Or if you have a lot of it, you can throw it away. Or you might even use it as it as it loses the oil. You could use that as a fire starting method. One of the other common methods in the old days was use this little um, looks like a spring. It's a little another little tow worm device. You, you twist this up on the end of the ramrod and then use that spring just to that I don't know if you call that a tow worm or not. You know, another style of tow worm to scrub out the barrel. This one's a little bit bigger. It won't fit down my 50 caliber, caliber rifle. It fits down my trade gun, my 62 caliber trade gun. But these were very common. You see those a lot on rendezvous records. These little uh, record lists of what they brought to rendezvous. Okay. And I've even seen those on in Indian, in, in period paintings of Indian portraiture. They screw those into their hair and have those hanging around. And I've seen them used as decorative items on dresses and things. So you got some tow couple different tow worms. Sometimes you, you'll have some fabric, some pillow ticking or other fabric that you can cut and use as patching to clean your rifle with. Um, if you was to use this as patching to clean your rifle, when you're done with it, you, could, you might want to rinse that out and keep that and use it as char cloth for flint, flint and steel fire making. Okay. Now we all shoot flint lock rifles. The percussion, again referring back to my rifle video, the percussion rifle came in a little bit later. So if you're using flintlock rifles, you're going to want to have a little flint wallet in your gear where you're going to keep some extra flints, some really sharp flints. These are brand new. 
think this is a black English flint and this is a French amber flint. Um, you want to keep some of these new. And when I go out just shooting with the guys and stuff, you know, I use these flints over and over. But whenever I go hunting, I'll always replace my flint in my rifle with a brand new sharp flint because you don't want to take the chance of having your flint be kind of dull and missing a good shot at a deer because of that. Okay, so a flint wall, it's a handy thing to have. Just a little, you can see it's just a little piece of leather with a couple of pockets sewn on it. So a very easy little project you can make at home in a, on a Saturday morning or an evening in the winter time when you've got time to do things. And most of these things in, the, in your shooting bag you can make yourself. Now a lot of times you'll go to rendezvous and you can find uh, traders that make these, these things for you if, you're, if you don't f feel like you're handy enough. But Okay, so... Uh, speaking of cleaning the guns, when, which we last talked about with these clean, these toe worms, um, also on the end of a ramrod you frequently have a cleaning jag. And that cleaning jag is designed to hold some kind of patching material to clean your rifle with. Um, I wouldn't recommend that you use any kind of petroleum-based cleaners, but there are a, a number of good black powder solvents out there modernly that you can use to clean your rifle. Or you can just use hot water and scrub it out with hot water. You know, if you, if you scrub it real well with some, some of this toe, then run a couple of pieces of fabric down. Now, nowadays we have shooting patches or good pillow ticking material. Historically, they may or may not have had extra fabric that they used for their rifles. Um, if they didn't, you know, you could, you, you might be able to use brain tan. It might be a little tight, however, so you have to get some really thin material. But this toe does a really good job. And then when you're all done cleaning up and get your your lock and your barrel all well scrubbed out, you're going to want to run some oil or some grease. Now you might have some some bear grease in, a, in your waterproofing can you can use, or you can carry a little oil bottle like this. Now we happen to, nowadays we use uh, re regular gun oil, or some of us have been fortunate enough to find some old supplies of oil oil that we can use. We've also rendered oil out of bear fat, and uh, even a beaver tail. If you look out there on uh, YouTube, you'll see a friend of ours uh, that did a sh uh, video on rendering oil out of a beaver tail. So. Uh, you can re find that and fill up your oilers. So you're just going to put a little oil on your patch and run that up and down the barrel of your rifle to kind of keep it cleaned up. Now the original Mountaineers use their guns a lot more than we do nowadays. So, um, you know, they're cleaning. Uh, I don't think that they were quite as fanatical as we are today about keeping them clean. A lot of the old guns you'll see were pretty much wore out. The bores were scrubbed out. The flash hole on the side was rusted out quite a bit. So, um, but today we spend a lot of money on our guns so we want to keep them in, in good shape and especially when you go hunting you want to keep your your guns in tip-top shape because uh, you don't want to miss a good animal. Now when it comes time to load and shoot we're going to need black powder. We've got a number of uh, horns here. Again as a trapper left St. Louis he, he more than likely had either the horn he used back in the States or on his getting prepared to leave St. Louis he'd go buy a new cow horn powder horn made out of a cow, a cow's horn. And powder horns are a whole new form, a whole particular form of artwork. They go way back. Um, Revolutionary War and Golden Era powder horns are beautiful, a beautiful form of art. Um, we carry fairly plain horns out here because they got used and abused a lot. You can see on this one that it's a nice antique stained horn and it's got a, a copper patch on here because it probably wore through or got a whole beat inside of it. Okay, so that's a and this particular powder horn you can see is attached right to the pouch. Now that's a, a, a decision you're going to have to make also, whether you want to attach it to the pouch or whether you want to carry your powder horn on a separate strap. Okay, This one is a, a buffalo horn. Um, the Indians frequently had buffalo, a very plain buffalo horn with some kind of strap on it. And so there's that's the buffalo horn I carry. Here's a what we might, it's a flat horn, it's been molded flat, and it's kind of what's called the day horn that you might carry inside your bag for just a day hunt, especially back east if you're squirrel hunting and stuff and you didn't want to, the, the, the big powder horn swinging around out there, you might have a, a little day horn like this. Now families back east in the settlements in the states frequently had what they called a family horn hanging on their, their mantle or somewhere in the cabin back east. That they, It was a large horn. They had several pounds of gunpowder in it, and they used that to fill up their horns that went on their bag, their pouch. So powder horns might be a topic for a separate video, but you want to look around for a, a, a powder horn, decide whether you want to make it yourself. Uh, I know these were made by Rick and I. 
Um, powder horns were one of the original crafts that I, I got into this hobby doing because it was fun to make them and do some scrimshaw on them. This likes, looks like a nice old antiqued handmade horn. But again, you can buy them uh, some of these companies I've mentioned, the Dixie Gunworks, Track of the Wolf, another uh, log cabin shop. Um, there's a bunch of them that uh, you can use a bunch of powder horns. Now let's talk about the actual loading of the gun. Um, a lot of guys will sometimes carry their bullets or their, their, their balls, their lead balls, around loose in their pouch and then patch them individually. This one's a larger one that goes to fits my trade gun. This is a 62 cal. Or, yeah, 62 cal and patch them individually and put them down the, the barrel of the rifle. Now I find it much more convenient to have some pre-made, some loads made up and these things called loading blocks. And this was one that, that hangs on my bag and it's got four shots as you can see. And these are greased patches, the same patching material here. Uh, just cut it off, grease it up and put, punch it into these loading blocks. So when it comes time to load, all I've got to do is get out my powder measure Here's one example of a powder measure, and there's others floating around. Measure your load, put it down the barrel, put this preloaded block over the muzzle of the barrel, and use your wiping stick to force it down the barrel. Okay, so we were gonna planning on doing a little shooting today, so I preloaded up a number of shooting blocks to be ready to shoot about 20 or 25 shots. Usually about the maximum I like to go before I take some time to clean out my rifle because it gets increasingly difficult to, to load. So, shooting blocks are good to have. Um, I don't carry all those around in my bag unless I'm going to shoot. If I'm just out hunting, um, if you can't do it in four shots, and, and ideally, of course, one shot is the, what we're aiming for. That wasn't an intentional pun, but one shot ought to do it. You know, two shots at the max. I've got four here just in case uh, I need to, you know, finish it off or, or something else. So you can carry that on the side of your your bag. I carry all these things hung on my bag so they're convenient. Also I've got, besides the powder measure, I've got a pan brush for the pan of my, my uh, flintlock and a vent pick for making sure the vent into the barrel is cleaned out. And you can see that a lot of these other guys carry similar things. This has got a little tiny pan pick and a bigger one, a little stiff boar bristle pan brush. Because you want to brush out the residue in the pan of your gun. So make sure that you know you don't get a lot of uh, fouling built up there and and uh, ruin your shots. So that's a, a pretty simple introduction to different kinds of shooting bags and the things that are carried in them. Again, you're going to want to do a little bit of research before you launch into buying the materials and decide what size you want. Um, the books I'll show you will give you some great ideas. Um, one of the things you, you know you consider, you'll, you'll notice that these, this bag is lined with some old material. This one's lined with some, some linen also. So you know there's some advantages to lining it. Uh, one thing does it, it keeps the, sh the leather from, uh, from misshaping. It also absorbs moisture and keeps your leather from rotting. Um, inside the bag you might there, there's there's double bags that has two pouches. That's kind of nice to separate certain things. Or inside the pouch frequently you'll have other little bags to carry some of these items in because you don't want to just you know haphazardly throw all your stuff loose in the bag then you have a hard time finding finding stuff when you need it so I carry you know some of these worms and the toe and stuff in separate bags inside the inside the main bag um, let's see if there's anything else of real interest in there I think I've got it all out um, if you have a percussion rifle of course you're going to want to carry your caps in there and then there's a capping device to carry caps we didn't talk much about that there's a nice pretty looking little uh, ant uh, deer antler powder measure so you can make these measures yourself this particular measure I made here I like because it fits down the barrel of my rifle and so rather than in, in certain conditions and in in, in, uh, in pressure hunting situations or shoot, speed shooting it's nice to be able to drop that right down the barrel that, all that's made out of is a, is a 30 out 6 cartridge that I've cut the end off and flared and punched the primer out and soldered a loop in the back and you can make different sizes of these if you wanted to you can make four or five of these with different lengths and measure your powder. That's one thing I didn't talk about is a powder measure. I don't have one right here because I usually just use this. But you want some kind of device to measure your powder so you can find out how much your powder measures carry. This one carries 90 grains. Um, so if I'm deer hunting, I'll usually put that in 
plus a little bit more. But you, if you get a buy a graduated powder measure, it's, it's handy to have around so you can use that to, to gauge your loads. Sometimes when you're just uh, out on the range shooting with the buddies, you might not want to use 90 grains. You can drop down to 50 or 60 grains and, and have plenty good accuracy on the target. Okay, now another thing you consider is, you know, and, and look at your historic paintings on this. Remember in one of my earlier videos I talked about the paintings of Alfred Jacob Miller and it, you, you decide whether you're going to carry your, horn, your bag on the right. You know, you might want to carry it on your left. Some, in some of the paintings you'll see the bag on the right, the horn on the left. Again, in this case, you'll see the, this, this gentleman carries his horn attached to his bag right on the right side. And, and it's all, all a matter of personal preference and how well you can load that way. I carry mine separately, but I carry them both on the right. A, a separate, separate bag and, and horn. Um, so, you know, you, if you, you haven't done that before... Pardon? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, we got some friends off cameras giving me some good tips. Another thing you want to decide is how high you want to carry your bag. Now frequently you'll see guys that are new on the range, they got their bag slung way down here by their leg, kind of at the end of the reach of their, their arm. And so they can, you know, they think that's great because they can reach right in there. The problem with that is it bangs around on your leg and it's swinging around all over the time. When you see those guys, you know that they only shoot on a hunting range. If you was to go out in the woods hunting with your bag slung way down there, I mean, that's just a nightmare. It's always in the way. Every time you bend over, it's going to come swinging out in front of you. So I prefer to carry my bag a little bit higher right up here. One of the utilities that is you can pin it with your elbow. When you're hunting or if you happen to be riding, you can pin your, your powder horn and your shooting bag under your elbow. And then when I'm loading, I happen to have a particularly long gun. So most of my loading, the barrel is right here. So I can fill up my measure and dump it right here, right in front of my face. So, you know, practice or put that on, put your bag on and determine where you like it. You know, you can carry it a little bit lower, but I like it pretty high right up there where you can use your elbow to cover it. Plus, when it's that high and you bend over, it doesn't have as much momentum to swing out in front of you and get in the way. So that's a good, uh, a good tip about uh, carrying the bag. Um, that about wraps it up. I'm going to go into a few books here in just a few minutes and show you some of the books where you can find patterns, some pictures of shooting bags, and then if anything occurs to me that I forgot about, here in the session today I'll, I'll cover them. So uh, we'll see you again in just a few minutes. All right, let's see if we can get this uh, powder horn and shooting bag video wrapped up. I just got back from the desert, I uh, had a great trip out there looking for wild horses. Unfortunately we didn't see any wild horses until the very last day when we were leaving camp. Several of the vehicles had already driven off. The last feller who was in camp was lucky enough to look up on the ridge there. And right above camp there were 13 wild horses looking down at the remains of our campfire as we all drove off in the distance. So isn't that, uh, isn't that the luck? Anyway, uh, we've been talking quite a bit about shooting bags and powder horns. I wanted to just show you a few uh, resources here. So uh, we're going to zoom in here and take a close look at a few more things, some books and materials and things. There's several excellent books you can get on uh, how to make your own shooting bag and powder horn. One of the finest I found is this one here called Sketches of Hunting Pouches and Powder Horns, Accoutrements of Southern Appalachia. This is a fantastic resource. Uh, the author is Jim Webb, done in 1998. And I don't know how well you can see that, but as I flip through the pages, it's got all kinds of different patterns and styles of shooting bags very helpful because it shows how they're laid out, the types of uh, the, the patterns you'll need, gives you ideas of decoration, a bunch of uh, examples of accoutrements inside. This is a great book to have. I'll try to list this at the end of the video so you can get a, a better look at it. Another good book, another good resource is this book, The Frontier Rifleman. Uh, author's name is Richard B. LaCrosse Jr. And it's got a couple of chapters in there on different shooting bags shooting pouches, similar to the other book on how to construct them, materials to use, those sorts of things. If you happen to have or have access to the Book of Buckskinning series, there's a great article in here on shooting bags. This is a Book of Buckskinning number four. And first article in here is the traditional hunting, pouch, hunting pouch excuse me, by Stephen M. Lelioff. 
traditional hunting pouch. This is one of the first uh, first articles I use for inspiration on making hunting pouches. Uh, recall earlier in the video we showed you an elk foot hunting pouch and uh, by my friend and trapping partner Rick and there's an example of it right there in the in the book. So again, book of buckskinning, excuse me, six, not four, book of buckskinning six. I must have been looking at that upside down. And lastly, another fantastic book I acquired not too long ago, Recreating the 18th Century Powder Horn by Scott and Kathy Sibley. I found this to be a very inspirational, excellent book, uh, especially I'm making a golden age horn, a little more fancy horn. This takes you through all the different steps, very good how-to book, step-by-step -step on how to construct a horn. And you'd think it would be pretty easy, but when it gets right down to, to building a horn, taking something from like a raw buffalo horn or, or cow horn like this into a finished product, there's quite a few uh, little steps in there and there's some good tips in here. Now, again as I mentioned earlier in the video, you got a choice. A lot of uh, trappers as they're leaving the east and settlements and stuff would have uh, a constructed a, a cow horn, powder horn. This one's kind of a crude one I did some years ago. Um, if you're going to make a fancy one where you're going to do a little decoration and scrimshaw on it, you probably want to get a nice white one like this. It's got a large, large area to do some engraving or scrimshaw on. I guess technically it's not really scrimshaw when it's done on a powder horn, but really engraving. Scrimshaw, I guess, is limited really to uh, whale's teeth and kind of a maritime um, theme there. I like a, a very curvy horn like this rather than one that's, too, that's more straight because I like it to be able to hug the side of my body and fit in the contour underneath my arms and my rib there. Um, well these powder horns or these raw horns are available in a number of places, a number of craft places. Uh, I usually watch for them at rendezvous and try to pick them up where, wherever I can for future projects. Likewise, a good buffalo horn, a buffalo cap like this are available in a lot of places. And this makes a good Western Plains uh, mountain man style powder horn like the one I showed in my video that I carry here. You can see after you have you work with a little bit and decorate it up, it comes a little bit more fancy. But uh, frequently you'll see in some of the paintings of Bodmer, Miller, and others that the Indians used these horns, obviously, because they were readily available to them. Now, if you want to get a little bit fancier, maybe a little bit earlier time frame, you can make a Golden Age horn where it's got some, some scrimshaw on it, or again, <laughs> excuse me, some engraving on it. I don't know if you can see that there or not, but I did this horn, uh, oh, about 30 years ago when I took a, a little powder horn making class from a, or a famous rifle builder named Dennis Mulford while he still lived here in Salt Lake. And this is antiqued a little bit to give it some, some artificial aging. Your choice of straps on what, what you use. I usually use some kind of a thin strap but sturdy leather. Um, or you can use, this is a, a hand woven wool powder horn strap. So, you know, again, your, your choice there. Um, what you use for a, a plug in the horn is, is a matter of preference. I f seem to frequent or, or tend to enjoy or frequently use these uh, fiddle pegs, just old uh, violin pegs. Or you can carve one out. This has got a little fancy heart-shaped peg there on it. One thing I would suggest when you do this is not to drill a straight hole, but have a tapered hole so the, the plug doesn't stick in there really tightly to, where, to a point where you can't get it out very easy. A tapered hole is kind of nice to keep it uh, going in and out very easy. And also, this plug here, if I was to use it very heavily in, in the woods, it would probably tend to get busted off and leave the peg inside the hole. So you might want a stouter plug than that. But when you do a tapered hole, uh, sometimes you need to, to line it with a little beeswax so the plug will stick in there a little bit better. So. That's that on powder horns. Again, I refer to the books. Let's talk a little bit of, or for a few minutes about uh, materials to use. I generally make most of my bags out of a light vegetable tanned leather. Even something as thin as this. This is quite thin. This is a little bit thicker. I've made several out of this. Um, vegetable tan, also called oak tan leather. You lay out a nice pattern. Um, you can, you can uh, stamp a, an initial in your flap of the pouch to tell who the owner is. Uh, this thinner leather you can use to, to line the flap. 
I put an edge on it. I've also made some pretty good uh, bags out of this head, this uh, little bit of thin, uh, I, I believe this is pigskin, yeah, pigskin, you know, I got from a leather dealer in Tennessee. I've also seen people use a little bit heavier brain tan or alum tan deer or elk hide to make a, a very serviceable pouch. In fact, in one of Alfred Jacob Miller's paintings, you'll see a, a couple pouches made out of this with a couple lines of quill work across it as, as a decoration. So that makes it a very nice pouch. So that's about it on powder horns and shooting bags. I probably miss a couple things, but if you refer to those four books I showed you, there are plenty of uh, resources you can use to, to make your own powder horn. Uh, there, go out on the internet, look around, there's a lot of resources out there. A lot of fine powder horn makers and bag makers out there if you want to just purchase a really well built product. Hey, thanks for uh, watching and uh, hope to see you again soon on Teton Todd's Mountain Adventures.